صلوا على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيد الممجد بشير المصدق المصطفى الأمجد محمود الأحمد أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولا أن الله ولا الظالمين من الأولين والآخرين أما بعد فكقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والفجر وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر هل في ذلك قسم الذي حجر ألم تر كيف فعل ربك بعاد إرم ذات العماد التي لم يخلق مثلها في البلاد وثمود الذين جابوا الصخر بالواد وفرعون ذي الأوتاد الذين تغوا في البلاد فأكثره فيها الفساد فصب عليهم ربك صوت عذاب إن ربك لبالمرصاد فأما الإنسان إذا مبتلاه ربه فأكرمه ونعمه فيقول ربي أكرما وأما إذا مبتلاه فقدر عليه رزقه فيقول ربي أهانا كلا بل لا تكرمون اليتيم ولا تحاضون على طعام المسكين وتأكلون التراث أكلا لما وتحبون المال حبا جما كلا إذا دكت الأرض دكا دكا وجاء ربك والملك صفا صفا وجيء يومئذ بجهنم يومئذ يتذكر الإنسان وأن له الذكرى يقول يا ليتني قدمت لحياتي فيومئذ لا يعذب عذابه أحد ولا يوثق وثاقه أحد يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي سلوات الله سلام Master of our age, Imam Zamana, my respected elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'a wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Our discussion last night allowed us to gauge the various levels of depth that the Holy Quran has for you and I to explore. We mentioned a particular word and we said that this Quran is a deep ocean. And therefore, of course, the more you are prepared and more capable of diving further into that ocean, the more you can explore and the more you can extract from it. And ultimately with this ocean there is no floor, there is no means to reach the end and the more you dive, the further you go, the more treasures you will eventually unearth. And therefore our discussion tonight insha'Allah leads us into the commentary of the Surah of Fajr itself. We mentioned last night that the chapter of Fajr, the dawn, is one that is associated and attributed to the master of the martyrs, Aba Abdullah al Hussein, salawatullahu salamu alayhi. Many a time, you and I, when we hear the word verses, Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma inna irji ila rabbi kiradiyatan mardiya, we normally associate just those lines with the master of the martyrs. However, our sixth Imam has that narration which we discussed yesterday which says that the entire chapter is dedicated towards the master of the martyrs and that you should recite this chapter in your compulsory, your obligatory and your additional prayers for he who recites this chapter in those prayers he will be raised alongside the master of the martyrs in that same station of heaven on the day of judgment inshallah and therefore it gives us a means to see the movement of the Karbala in this entire chapter and therefore, the first thing we need to do tonight is look at the opening verses. And we need to see one aspect in particular. And tonight, in regards to the opening verses, what we will look at is the following Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Wal Fajr, 
وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر هل في ذلك قسم لذي حجر Now this is a series of oaths that are taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and therefore at the end of these oaths he puts forward the most intriguing of point he says that for the one who has understanding there will be deep connotation for the one who has understanding of this oath and therefore straight away we can see that there is a huge emphasis on the oath itself and therefore we need to understand the methodology of the oaths taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the Quran before we understand what these various oaths actually mean we have these series of verses wal fajr i swear by the dawn walayalin ashr by the 10 nights and as we go through these oaths the question will normally be posed is well which dawn is this the dawn that we rise for our fajr salah or is it a different dawn walayalin ashr and he also takes an oath by these 10 nights which 10 nights in particular how many different scholarly opinions are there on these various oaths and as we mentioned yesterday that every verse has 70,000 layers to it and therefore one can already see that when we talk about the oath of the dawn the oath of the 10 nights the oath of the odd and the even and so on and so forth there must be a number of layers that we can extract from what do these layers express for you and I and before we come to understanding this point, we need to understand the methodology and therefore the value of taking an oath by something. Surely, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking an oath by these various issues, there must be something deep and intriguing within this oath. We find that these oaths taken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are not only within this chapter. We find that many chapters within Juz Amma have many verses which have oaths within them. We find that there can be a difference in the style of these oaths. For example, wal fajr waliyalin ashr. They appear to be quite ambiguous in themselves. I take an oath by the ten nights. Any child, any adult, any person will come and ask me, well, which ten nights are you taking an oath by? But when you compare and contrast this to another oath within Quran, for example, washamsi wa I swear by the sun and its brilliance. Straight away, it becomes clear what the sun is. Everyone here knows what the sun is. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the sun, it's clear. Whereas when he takes an oath by the dawn, when he takes an oath by ten nights, or when he takes an oath by the odd and the even, one cannot say for certain that it is specific to A, B, C because it is ambiguous in itself it leaves it open for us to have a deeper interpretation towards it and therefore straight away we can see although there are oaths within the Quran there are various types of oaths in fact someone may think that the oaths taken in Quran can only be found within Juz Amma within that last Juz of Quran actually Juz, actually the oaths can be found throughout the whole Quran there are many times where oaths are mentioned within the Qur'an and not just only in this last section of the Qur'an it's elsewhere within the Qur'an for you and I to search out and see where else these oaths may be present for you and I in regards to oaths we need to look at it firstly from the dynamic of grammar and then also in regards to the various examples of the oaths and then thirdly we need to understand the methodology of how the emphasis is made within a particular oath so firstly when we see about oaths themselves we have various words that are used to give an oath to something even in the English language you might say I take a promise or I take an oath or I take a covenant these all are similar ways of making a promise but they hold slightly different connotations why make an oath or why make a covenant why say the two words unless they are slightly different in themselves and therefore even in the Arabic language there are various words both within the Quran and within the Ahadith can be found for the term promise or for the term oath many which we are comfortable and aware of 
As an example, we have the word Ahad. We have the word Mithaq. We have the word Nadr. We have the word Yameen. And we have the word Hilf as well. When it comes to Ahad, we are very aware that this is a covenant. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this word many times in the Quran. For example, in Surah Al Yaseen, we see, Alam a'ahad ilaykum ya bani adama alla ta'budu shaytan innahu lakum aduwum mubeen. Did I not make a covenant with you, O children of Adam, that you would not serve Satan? Surely he is your open enemy. Here we find that a covenant, Ahad, is made between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This isn't a promise, this is a form of a covenant made between us. But it's another word that is used for that oath that we have taken between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mithaq is used within the Quran. For example, famously, there is a mithaq taken between Banu Israel and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they will not attribute another god to him, that they will not kill each other with insolence, that they will look after each other, and so on and so forth. And therefore, often in the Qur'an, mithaq is also used. Nadr is also used. In fact, you find in the Risala of all of our Miraji', they highlight that each of these have a various connotation to them. We often take a nadr. We say, for example, if I do well in my exams, and many of us have finals coming up, and if I do well in my exams, I will do such and such. I will pray two rak'ah salah. I will put money into charity, and so on and so forth. These are covenants. These are promises made between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also have the word yameen, and we have the word hilf as well. Hilf is very interesting, because we know that there is a term in history of Islam called Hilf al-Fudul. Hilf al-Fudul was those groups of people that had taken an oath, you see the word Hilf, had taken an oath to protect the rights of anyone who was innocent and being oppressed. And therefore again you can see how these oaths come into play. Therefore as we continue in, we can go deeper into this understanding. There are many types of oaths that we can take. If I want to take an oath, there are words that I can use. I can just say the word, my Lord, I promise you. But in Arabic language, there are five different techniques in order to discuss an oath. One of them is to negate an oath. If you don't want to take a promise by something, there is a term by this. And if you want to take a promise by something, there are four terms by this. Let us explore these four and you will begin to see how all of this begins to move with the event of Karbala. When you don't want to take a promise, there is something called Lam al-Nafi, Lam of negation. We find this within the Holy Quran. In fact, amongst the scholars of Quran, this is one of the most hotly debated issues amongst the scholars. Amongst the scholars of Qur'an commentary, there is a disagreement upon this point. Lam al-Nafi is to negate the oath and say, you know what, I'm not going to take an oath by this thing. As an example, we find, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, La uqsimu bihadha al-Balad. You see many translations, and you may have this in front of you if you want to go very quickly. When you go to Surah al-Balad, you find most translations say, nay. I take an oath by this city, doesn't it? Most of us have read this translation. Nay, I take an oath by this city. Whereas actually, the majority of those scholars who look at it from a grammatical perspective will say this is not saying nay. This is saying, I do not take an oath by this city. La uqasimu bihadha al-balad. No, I do not take an oath by this city. Why? Wa antahillun bihadha al-balad. Because... O oh Muhammad, your blood is deemed halal to be spilt by this city. Do you see that? How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take an oath by this city when it is capable, willing to slaughter the Holy Prophet of Islam? This city is Makkah. Whereas later on in Quran, we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does take an oath by this very same city, by Makkah. وَالتِّينِ وَالزَّيْتُونِ وَطُورِ سِينِينَ وَهَاذَ الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينَ Now he changes it. 
He says earlier on during the period of Makkah, in the time in which Rasulullah was situated in Makkah, his blood was deemed halal for the people of Makkah. They believed they could slaughter Rasulullah. Therefore, I am not willing to take an oath by this city. But after the migration and after the conquest, now Makkah had also become part and parcel of the Muslim movement. Therefore, now I can take an oath by this city. This is the first one. Lam al-Nafi, to negate an oath. I will not take an oath by this. As we said, there is difference of opinion. Then you come to four types of oaths where you do take an oath. There is no difference of opinion on this. You do take the oath. And these four have various degrees of depth to them. So for example, there is height and proximity. There is more of a higher level of covenant with each level. For example, the four are Wow al Qasam, you can say Wallah. There is Ta al Qasam, Tallah. Then there is Lam al Qasam. And then there is Ba al Qasam, Billah. You can say, I swear by Allah by any four of these. So often we say, Wallah. Wallahi, I saw it. Wallah, this took place. Wallah, inshaAllah, we will pray for you. We have this where we say this and we often hear other people from other languages often say the word wallahi and we hear it in often. But in fact, there are various levels that someone can say. Someone can say tallahi. It means the same thing. I swear by God, but it's higher. Or you might be able to say billahi. Or you can take from lam al-qasam as well. There are many examples. For example, when we take billah, let's take ba al-qasam. We have this in Dua Kamail. The commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu alayhi wa uses Ba al-Qasam. Fabi'izzatika ya sayyidi wa mawlai. Uqsimu sadiqan la intalaktani natiqa. You see here? Fabi'izzatika. I swear, Fabi'izzatika. The commander of the faithful is taking an oath with Ba al-Qasam. The Quran has an example of Lam al Qasam. In chapter number 15, Surah Al Hajr, verse number 72, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath. He himself takes an oath. By whom? By Rasulullah. You see, we can take an oath by each other. I swear by your life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the life of Rasulullah. La amruka. I swear by your life, O Muhammad. These Makkans were wandering blindly within a state of intoxication. Lam al Qasam. And then you have Ta al Qasam. Ta al Qasam we find specific to the movement of Karbala. That's not to say it can't be seen anywhere else. But there are two famous incidents in regards to Ta al Qasam which are unique to the Ahl al Bayt. And so unique that they set one of the most amazing precedents in all of history. When we come to the day of Ashura, 10th of Muharram, we find that the great martyr, Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, may Allah bless his soul, arrives at the camp of the master of the martyrs. Now, we all know the story very well. There are many traditions to describe what happened. Some say that he came with his son and with his servant, some say that he came with his arms tied behind his back and a blindfold across his eyes as if to say to his master Hussein ibn Ali I am so sorry for what I have done and therefore this is the way in which I present myself imagine for a second na'udhu billah I was you were the one who had performed that action of Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi when you now approach the master of the martyrs on that day of course you would want to come with your arms bound. And he approached the camp in this way. As he throws himself at the blessed feet of the master of the martyrs, he cries out a particular statement. The statement is, Halli min tawba. Halli min tawba. Which means, is there any way for me to perform tawba? Tawba isn't istighfar. Istighfar is to seek protection or forgiveness. Tawbah is to return. Halli min tawbah. 
Is there any way I can return back to you, O Master of the Martyrs, spiritually? Is there any way I can reconnect with you? There is a, a removal of that block between yourself and me. Halli min tawbah. The response from the Master of the Martyrs is Tallahi. I swear by Allah, yes. That was sufficient. To take that oath at that point was the strongest oath the Master of the Martyrs could give. Tallahi, indeed, I swear by your very coming to me is sufficient. All is forgiven. And as we know, Hur went out and became that great martyr on the 10th of Muharram. Now we fast forward and we come to the incident where the captives of Ahlul Bayt are also bound. Their feet are also bound. Their arms are also bound. They come to Damascus and they are made to wait outside that evil tyrant's palace as he decorated it, as he began to get court jesters, as he played with his monkeys, as he drank alcohol. At that point, again famously we know, a very elder man came and spoke to Imam Zainul Abideen sallallahu alayhi wa The words, praise be to Allah who has ridded us from your enmity, has ridded us from what you have performed upon us, that oppression. The Imam can respond in any way in which he wishes. What does he respond? O oh, Shaykh, have you read the Qur'an? Yes, I am half of the Qur'an. Well, tell me, have you come across that verse? قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمُوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Yes, I have. Have you come across that verse in which says that give the nearest of the kin their rights? Indeed, I have. Have you come across that verse, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ وَلِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمْ وَرِجْسَ أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ Indeed, yes, I have. Indeed, know, O oh Shaykh, that those verses are about us. The moment that Shaykh realizes that those verses are about Ahl al-Bayt, whom he is saying these very words to, who he is present in front of, the captives, what does he say? Exactly the same words as Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi. Exactly identical words. Halli min tawba. The hadith tells us he removes his amama. He tears at his collar and he strikes himself. Halli min tawba. Is there any way back for me in this circumstance? Look at the words I have said to you in the circumstance in which you are in. In exactly the same response, our fourth imam responds identical to the third imam. He says, Tallahi. I swear by Allah, your very reaction, the fact you have separated yourself from your zeed, means that I have accepted that repentance. Allah has accepted that repentance. My oath in front of you is strong enough upon this day. And note that he, that great old man, runs into the palace of Yazid and begins to curse him and say, how dare you have done this? Yazid calls upon the butchers within his own palace the soldiers to strike down that old man and he is granted martyrdom. Note here that when Ahl al-Bayt take an oath upon your behalf, when they can stand and say the words, Tallahi, the precedent is set that your end will end in martyrdom in front of Ahl al-Bayt. You see the oaths, they're not light. There is a deep connotation to it. So we had four. We had Wow al-Qasam, Lam al-Qasam, Ba al-Qasam, and Ta al-Qasam. The fourth one was Wow al-Qasam. Wow al-Qasam is presented to us many times within the Holy Quran. Wal Fajr, Wal Naziat, Wal Shams, Wal Asr. And the idea here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking an oath for the purpose of two principal points. The first one is that, of course, he wants to emphasize what he is going to say. And therefore, with that emphasis, there is always a response to those oaths. The response, and this is very key, the response is called jawab. 
We are all comfortable with the word jawab. Jawab is the response that you give. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes any oath in Quran, it is always followed with a jawab. It is always followed with a response from him. Let me give a very simple example. Surah Al-Asr. The oath is, Wal Asr. I swear by time. The jawab is what follows. Inna al-insana lafi khusr. Most certainly, man is in an absolute state of loss. So here you have the oath and you have the jawab. And there is always a balance between these. There is always a reason for these oaths and these jawabs. There is a correlation between them. The idea here is emphasis from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes to do is make an extra emphasis so that what you realize and I realize is that there is going to be a certain weight to the jawab. I want to present these oaths so that you are aware of the quality of the emphasis that I'm about to give you. Now emphasis is something very important in Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses many different types of emphasis. And for those of us who are readers of Quran, and for those of us who want to engage more in Quran, we should become aware of how these various forms of emphasis come to play. So that when you read a verse, you can see, oh Allah is emphasizing something very specific here. Let's give you a couple. As an example, one emphasis is called Adat al-Hasr. Adat al-Hasr is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds a letter in order to make an extra emphasis. If we give you the word inna, it's translated as surely or certainly. Inna. We have this word very often. But with Adat al-Hasr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds an emphasis to it. He doesn't say inna, he says innama. And therefore you have two difference. It's not surely or indeed, it's now innama, most surely or most certainly, most indeed. You will know many verses yourself that have innama. And now when we read these verses, you will see there is an additional emphasis from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As an example, innama. Amrahu ida arada shay'an ayyakula lahu kun fayakun. Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just say the word inna? He could have said it, right? But he chooses not to say it. He wants to increase the emphasis of what he's about to tell you. And therefore he adds adat al hasr. Inna ma amruhu ida arada shay'an ayyakula lahu kun fayakun. You want to know my capability? You want to understand what God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really is? All I need to do is say the word kun, and it is. In fact, in the reality, it doesn't even need to say the word kun to make fayakun. But I will show you my capability by adding innama to that particular statement. Therefore, in the verse of Tathir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does exactly the same thing. He could have said, Inna yurid Allahu liyudhiba, but he doesn't. He wants the entire universe to separate this statement from any other statement. I'm not just going to tell you about tahara. I'm going to emphasize the tahara so no human being should miss the tahara of Ahlul Bayt. Inna ma yurid Allahu liyudhiba ankum arrisa Ahlul Bayt wa yatahirakum tathira. But if you don't know how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes an emphasis in Qur'an, you'll miss it. You see? And therefore, once I know innama is a step up, it's a great emphasis by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time I come across a verse that now says innama, I will stop. Let me double check what he's saying. Maybe something deep is here. Well, everything Allah tells me is important. There's nothing invaluable and nothing unvaluable. Everything is important, but the fact that he wants to make an additional emphasis, maybe I should take additional awareness of this. And that's one, Adat al-Hasr. Another one is called Lam al-Ta'kid. Lam al-Ta'kid. This is an additional Lam also to make an emphasis. Exactly the same idea, to make an additional emphasis so you and I observe what is being told to you and I. 
many examples. And this is where you can prepare Surah Al Yasin for those brothers and sisters who have uh, Quran with them. As an example, an extra lam in Surah Teen. We'll start there. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa Teen wa Zaytun wa Tura Sinin wa Hadha al-Balad al-Amin laqad khalaqna al-Insan fi ahsani taqwin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Arabic language could have said Qad. He could have said, surely, definitely, this man, most beautiful, most greatest of creation, the best of creation. Qad khalaqna al-Insan fi ahsani taqwin. But he didn't. Lam al taqid is an emphasis. He said, Laqad khalaqna al-Insan fi ahsani taqwin. In order to emphasize the realm of who a human being really is. I'm going to show you what is within you. I want you to be aware of your capability. And therefore I'll add that extra alarm for you to become aware of it. Surah Al Yasin has possibly one of the most beautiful examples of this. And to see this example opens up the mind because you and I are very comfortable insha'Allah with Surah Al Yasin. Go to the opening verses. Let's turn to verse, for example, verse number 13. If you have verse number 13 open in Surah Al-Yasin, we'll go through the 13, 14, 15. We all know these verses so well, like the back of our hand. But when we go through this little tafsir to see how this one letter of Lam is added, it will change your reading forever. If you don't know this tafsir, and you next time you read this verse, I promise you, you will look upon it differently, entirely differently. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَذُلِبْ لَهُمْ مَثَلًا أَصْحَابَ الْقَارِيَةِ إِذْ جَاءَهَا Mursalun. Everybody knows. And set out to them the example of the people of the town when messengers came to it. What happened? Who are these messengers? These messengers, according to the majority of tafsir, are two disciples of Isa alayhi salam. As we know, Isa alayhi salam had his disciples. And we know that Isa alayhi salam used to send his disciples on his behalf in order to bring people towards the religion of God. So Isa alayhi salam in this verse is sending his two disciples. Hadith tells us that one day these two disciples, they're going on towards this town and they come towards a farmer. As they come towards this farmer, of course, they invite this farmer towards the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say, we are disciples of Isa alayhi salam, the messenger of Allah. He has these attributes, these capabilities where he can cure the leper. He can cure the blind. He can raise people from the dead. And we, with our following of him, also have this capability. The farmer happened to have a son who was born blind. And therefore, the challenge was put. Well, if you claim to be able to do this, cure the blind, come do it. And the two companions, disciples, come and they cure the blind by the Blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that point, that man becomes a Muslim. The hadith give a title to this man that he's called Mu'min Al Yasin. He's the believer in Al Yasin. 680 years before Rasulullah was born into this earth, he believed in the station of Rasulullah in Ahlul Bayt. As it came, these two disciples moved on and they eventually got to that town that is mentioned within this verse. They went to the king of that town and as they were presenting Islam, he was obstinate in his ways. He disbelieved and he put these two disciples into prison. The next verse tells us what happened. إِذْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِ مُثْنَيْنِ فَكَذَّبُوهُمَا فَعَزَّزْنَا بِثَالِثٍ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ We sent to them two. They rejected both of them. So we strengthened them with a third. So they said, surely we are messengers to you. What happened here was that because these two disciples of Isa alayhi salam were placed into prison, Isa alayhi salam strengthened them with a third. This third is said to be Simon, the great disciple of Isa alayhi salam. So now Simon comes to this particular king. One narration tells us that he performs taqiyyah. This is an example of taqiyya in history. So that those who are into polemics and debating with other schools who deny the reality and the importance of taqiyya, it even started in Quran with Simon the disciple. 
So Simon becomes a performer of taqiyah, engages this king, gains his trust, and now comes to this king and is an advisor to the king. Eventually, he says to the king, you know those two people who are in the prison? Why don't we call them? Why don't we see what they were about, what they were claiming about this religion of theirs? The king agrees and brings these two. The two who are companions of Simon pretend not to recognize him. And now they say to him, please, present us this religion. They now begin to present their religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Simon says to the king, well, they're claiming these capabilities and they've proved that they have these powers. Surely your gods, the idols, can perform these same miracles. Call upon your idol to perform this miracle. The king laughs. He says, these idols, they're inanimate objects. They can't do anything for us. You know that. They can't speak. They can't perform any miracles. So at this point, Simon puts the clothes. That's the case. And they're claiming and have the capability on behalf of their Lord to perform these miraculous actions. Why don't you migrate yourself to this particular region? The king migrates. Now we come to the next verse. That what happens is that these three now go to the people within the city of this king. The king converts. But the other people in the city refuse and reject. Therefore verse 15 says... قَالُوا مَا أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا بَشْرٌ مِثْلُنَا وَمَا أَنْتَرَ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ أَنْتُمْ إِلَّا تَكْذِبُونَ They said, the rejecters said, You are nothing but mortals like ourselves, nor has the merciful God revealed anything to you. It is nothing more than a lie. The people of that town rejected these three companions of Isa alayhi salam. Now comes the key verse in regards to Lam al-Ta'keed and how the emphasis works within Qur'an. Verse number 16 responds, قَالُوا رَبُّنَا يَعْلَمُ إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ لَمُرْسَلُونَ Now here I want to show you something so beautifully subtle within Qur'an. For those of you who have the Qur'an, look at verse number 14 and the closing words. فَقَالُوا These companions say, إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ مُرْسَلُونَ Whereas verse number 16 says, قَالُوا رَبُّنَا يَعْلَمُ إِنَّا إِلَيْكُمْ لَمُرْسَلُونَ Why is it that in verse 14 it says مُرْسَلُونَ But in verse number 16 it says إِلَيْكُمْ uh, It says uh, إِلَيْكُمْ لَمُرْسَلُونَ Why is this extra lam in there? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just think I'll just add this extra lam for the fun of it? Of course not. Every letter, every haraka has a deep ocean within it. The lam of ta'keed is the emphasis. Why? Because the first time they introduced themselves, they said, Ilaykum mursaloon, we are messengers to you. But the second time they had to introduce themselves was on the basis that they had already been rejected. Therefore, they needed to up their game always. Almost they needed to say, you know what, we're going to make an extra emphasis. Inna ilaykum lamursaloon. We certainly are messengers. We're not just messengers. Certainly we are messengers. Therefore, this lam of ta'keed is imbalance. The level of rejection that was taking place has to be imbalanced with the level of haq. Batil and haq. And therefore, all those hundreds of people in that town that were rejecting the companions of Isa alayhi salam, when they responded, they needed to respond in a way which was equivalent to the level of battle that was being presented to them. Now here, when you understand this, this key point, key point, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes an emphasis in Qur'an, there is a balance to everything. Therefore, the level of rejection that is placed by any human, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to put at least an equivalent level of haq in order to override it. Otherwise, there's an imbalance. You can't have 300 people reject, but then these three companions put a subservient or a sub, uh, you know, it's not good enough, it's, it's not capable, a subservient level of presentation. There needs to be a balance. When we understand this point, that there is a balance in Qur'an, we also understand that in the oaths of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
there are the oaths and there is the jawab. Therefore, whatever the jawab is, the importance of what's being told in the jawab, there is an exact balance in the oath that is being taken. Wal asr. I swear by time. Inna al insan lafi khusr. There is an absolute balance between the oath and the jawab itself. The fact that I'm going to tell you that man is in an absolute state of loss. You know what khusr is? Is khasarat. This is a loss that is such a loss that it cannot be understood in this world. It's not like the kind of loss if I lose my iPhone. That's a loss. That's a painful loss for some of us. It's not the kind of loss if I lose my wallet. That's a loss. But khusr or khasara is not that kind of loss. Loss in khasara is the kind of loss that can only be felt on the day of judgment. When you stand before that Lord and he says that you did not pray, you did not fast, you did not fulfill your obligations, walk that sirat and know that you are going to fall to the pitfall of hell. That's khasara. That's loss. And therefore, in order to make a balance between that jawab, he needs to put an equivalent level of an oath for you to understand. I swear by time itself. You know, there's a great scholar, a Sunni scholar, Sheikh Fakhruddin Radi. Not everything should be taken from him. But in this particular instance, he puts a wonderful tafsir. He says, I was pondering upon this loss. You know, Allah says, I swear by time. Anyone who is elder will tell you the value of time. They will tell you how life has gone in a blink of an eye. Yesterday they were getting married. Yesterday their children were born. Yesterday, and all of a sudden they are at that age. I swear by time, most surely man is in loss. Sheikh Fakhruddin says, One day I was going towards the market, from my house towards the market. And he says, I saw this person who was bringing a block of ice from the house or from where I was towards the market. He wanted to sell this ice. And what I realized that as I was following behind him that cart that was pulling along that ice, from where I was at the time in which I first saw him to the time in which I eventually we went towards that market, that ice had melted away. It was this big, that block of ice at the beginning, but only a few minutes later that ice had melted to the point where it was almost gone altogether. At that point, I realized the oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wal asr inna linsan rafi khusr. We have exactly the same way in our lives, don't we? We see that yesterday we were here, and yesterday we accomplished, and all of a sudden it's gone. We have already aged to this point, and how quickly tomorrow will come. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts a balance between these. I'm going to show you the emphasis and the oath needs to be exactly in coordination with each other so that there is no imbalance. Now brothers and sisters, turn towards Surah Al-Shams. Turn towards Surah Al-Shams and see exactly the value of the oath of Surah Al-Shams. We find that we need to understand Surah Al-Shams for the oath and ultimately for the jawab itself. There is only ever one jawab, or normally there is one jawab. But in Surah Al-Shams, there are a number of oaths, aren't there? وَالشَّمْسِ وَدُهَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَخْشَاهَا And so on and so forth. I swear by the sun and its brilliance, and the moon when it follows the sun, and the day when it shows, and the night when it draws a veil over it, and the heaven and him who made that heaven, and the earth and him who extended it, and the soul and him who made it perfect, then he had inspired it to understand what is right and wrong. What is the jawab? Those are all oaths. Those are all oaths. What is the jawab? What is the jawab? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes eight oaths, one after another. And then in order to balance the importance of the jawab, he puts eight. I'm going to tell you such an important response 
قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Successful is he who purifies the soul. But in order for you to understand the value of that statement, the importance of self-purification, I'm going to give you eight oaths in order to balance that one statement. SubhanAllah. What a level of statement it must be. And therefore the oaths aren't random. It's not chosen because it rhymes. وَالشَّمْسِ وَدُهَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَا It's not because Sheikh, you know, Abdul Basit sounded good when he recited it. It's because it's relative to something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show you that the oaths are in direct connotation and link with the jawab. وَالشَّمْسِ وَدُهَاهَا I swear by the sun and the brilliance قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا What's the link? Is there any link at all between these two? What do you see? The sun and its brilliance. The sun, brothers and sisters, is what? It is that cornerstone for physical existence within our galaxy. You take away that sun and what will survive? Which animal, which season, which flower will even we be able to survive? Of course we won't because the trees will die. Therefore no oxygen will be created. Therefore we cannot breathe. Therefore the link is that. Look, the earth, the sun, it has a direct link. I swear by the sun and its brilliance. The blazing glory of this sun is there for you to see. It needs to be present for anything to be successful in the physical realm. Whereas, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا For you to have a cornerstone of your spiritual realm, for you to exist spiritually in this world, you need to purify your own soul. There is a direct link. It's not a joke. He didn't just choose the sun for the sake of it because it sounded pretty. He made a direct link between the two. وَالشَّمْسِ وَدُهَاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا But then the next one. وَالشَّمْسِ وَدُهَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا What about this moon? What about this brilliant moon? As you go deeper, remember there are 70,000 layers. You know what shams and qamar is? Shams is Rasulullah and Qamar is Ali ibn Abi Talib. I, s- oh, I swear by the sun and its brilliance and I swear by that moon which is orbiting and therefore قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا How can you have a purification of the soul unless there is the brilliant moon being Muhammad? and bring the luminary moon that is Ali ibn Abi Talib. Without those two, there is no qad aflaha man zakkaha. You see the balance. I'm going to present to you eight oaths in order for you to understand one jawab. And therefore, once you've delved into those eight oaths, you understand the value of that one jawab. Now we turn to Surah Al-Fajr. All this is one emphasis of just the word wow, just the letter wow, wow al qasam. والفجر وليال عشر والشفع والوتر والليل إذا يسر He takes an oath by all of these things I swear by the daybreak and the ten nights and the even and the odd and the night when it departs هل في ذلك قسم لذي حجر Truly in that there is an oath for the one who possesses deep understanding Oath after oath after oath. And then an additional emphasis. Not only am I going to give you oaths, I'm going to tell you that because of these oaths, there is something so deep within these oaths that it's for the one who has understanding of these oaths. And then he begins to tell us of the tyrants. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi'ad. Iramadatil imad. Allati lam yukhlak mithluha fil bilad. Wa thamood alladhina jabu sakhra. وَفِرْعَوْنَ الْأَوْتَارِ None of these are the jawab. You know what the jawab is? The jawab, إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَبِرْمِ Verse number 14. Most surely your Lord is ever watching. Let us go back. I swear by the dawn 
and by these ten nights, and by the odd and by the even, and by the night when it departs, most certainly in these oaths is something huge for the one that possesses knowledge. And then I'm going to tell you about the evil tyrants in history of Ad and Thamud and Fir'aun. And no, most certainly your Lord is ever watching over those tyrants. Imagine the movement of Karbala now coming to place. When it comes to Karbala, it is not just Yazid, is it? Before Yazid, there is a particular tyrant, Muawiyah. Before Muawiyah, there is another tyrant, Uthman. Before Uthman, there is another tyrant, Umar. Before Umar, there is another tyrant, Abu Bakr. Within all of these, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by these various things. And then he tells you at the end of it, O oh, oppressors, know that your Lord is ever watchful over your oppression. And therefore, O oh, Yazid, know that I am watching every movement that you are doing. Every time you lift that glass of alcohol to your lips, every time you play chess, every time that you play with that monkey, inna rabbaka rabir milsad, your Lord is watching over you. But for you to understand the value of that jawab, the true meaning and weight of such a statement, I need to take an oath by such grand things like the dawn and the even and the odd. And therefore the question is, what is this even and the odd? which we bring out tomorrow, insha'Allah. What an opening statement by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We needed to understand the value of the emphasis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before I can go any further into this. And therefore, brothers and sisters, the entire movement of Karbala started with an oath, did it not? It started with an oath. This chapter starts with an oath. Wal-Fajr. And therefore, the entire movement started with oaths as well. What did we say at the beginning of the majlis? There are words for a oath. For an oath, you can say an ahad. You can say nadar. You can say mithaq. You can say helf. Helf is a word for an oath. And we said helf al-fudul was those people who took an oath to look after the oppressed. In those days, the tyrant governor was Walid. We know his story very well. One day, Walid takes property from Aba Abdullah. Imagine, this is even before that oath of allegiance was demanded by Yazid. He takes property from the master of the martyrs. Aba Abdullah comes to Walid, the governor, and says, Give me back my property. This is my right. Walid refuses. You know what he says? The master of the martyrs says, If you refuse to give me my property, I take an oath by Allah. I will stand with my sword and I will ask the Arabs to rekindle helpful fudul and to have a group of people to come and take my case towards them. And they will decide whether that property is truly mine or whether it's truly yours. Abdullah bin Zubair says exactly the same thing. O oh, Walid, I too will stand with my sword. And by Allah, if you do not take, if you not give back the property of Hussein ibn Ali, I will fight until I have shed my blood for Hussein ibn Ali. An oath begins. And then a few days later, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan passes from this world. And Yazid writes a letter towards Walid. And he says, take the oath of allegiance. Do you see how everything begins with the oath? Take the oath of allegiance from Hussein ibn Ali. And if he does not, strike off his head. And anyone else who does not take that oath of allegiance to me, you may perform the same action to him as what you may do to Hussein ibn Ali. And the Imam enters into that harum where Walid and Marwan are situated. And they take that time, that opportunity to demand that oath of allegiance. Those famous words come from the blessed tongue of Hussein. What does he say? A man like me cannot give an oath of allegiance to a man like Yazid. We are that place in which the angels descend to the house. Whereas he is a man who is an open sinner and a drunkard. I will not give that oath of allegiance. I will not give that oath of allegiance. 
the same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refused to take an oath by that very same city. You see, the movement started with the oath, and even on the night of Ashura, it continued with that very same oath. Imagine you were in that tent. Imagine the master of the martyrs is standing in front of you. And he now addresses every one of us. And he would say, I relinquish you from that oath of allegiance that you have given to me. I will put out that candle. And under the darkness of the night, ride away. Ride in different directions so that the enemy cannot find you. What a level. What an oath that was taken at that point. The family members stand up and they rekindle that oath of allegiance with the master. How can we even consider taking that oath of allegiance back? How can we even consider leaving you, O Hussein, our master? And then stands the companions. Muslim ibn Awsaja stands up. I swear by Allah, take the oath. Wallahi, I swear by Allah. How could we even think about leaving you, O Hussein? How could we stand before Allah on the day of judgment? But rather, by us defending you, we have defended the honor of Rasulullah. I swear to you, O Hussein, my master, that I want nothing more than to fight tomorrow with that sword of mine. I swear I will attack them with my spear, and when my spear breaks, I will attack them with my sword. And when my sword breaks, I will throw stones at them. And O master, I swear that when I am attacked and when I am killed, if they wanted to, and if they cut me into pieces and raise me 70 times, I will continue to fight for you upon your behalf. And then another great companion, Zuhair ibn Qayn, he also stands up. O oh, Hussein, I re-emphasize my oath of allegiance towards you. I too say what he has just said, and I swear there is nothing more that I want than to be killed a thousand times for you. If they cut me into pieces and burn my body, I will cry out, My Lord, raise me a thousand times so I may defend the family of Rasulullah. These were the oaths that were taken upon that day. Muslim ibn Awsaja, what a companion, what a human being, what a man to stand in front of the enemies on that day and now attack them with that very same spear and that very same sword that he professed he would do so. He rides out like the lion that he was, and that he attacks the enemies, and the enemies come towards him, and the narrations tell us that he strikes 25 of the accursed down. But eventually they surround him, and they begin to throw their own spears at Hazrat Muslim. They begin to attack him with his swords, and at this point he is struck down and falls from his horse towards the burning plains of Karbala. He calls out towards his master, Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Oh my master, accept my final salutations. Come towards me. At this point, even the companions Habib ibn Madahir comes rushing out towards the aid. He comes rushing and they sit behind. They sit by the blessed body of Muslim ibn Awsaja. His body is torn to pieces. And at this point, he says to him in his final words, he he says, Habib says to him, if you are not passing from this world and I was not going to follow you shortly, I would take from you a bequest. With these final strength in him, he looks towards him and he points towards Imam al Hussein. He says, Oh, my dear companion, look after this man, Hussein. Look after him with every strength that you have. At this point, he begins to waver from this world as he passes. The Imam says, Inna he recites verse number 23 from Surah Al-Ahzab. Indeed, there are a group of people who have held true to their oath with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there are other companions who ensure that they held true to their oath. There is now John. John, Hazrat John, 
was a black slave of Abu Dhar Ghifari. As he went towards Hussein ibn Ali, he asks him and says, Oh my master Hussein, allow me to enter the battlefield and protect you with my life. Hussein says to him, John, you are free. I allow you to go escape with your life. And John responds back by saying, how can I even conceive such an idea, my master Hussein? How can I think about leaving you upon this day? Is it because my skin is black? Is it because I come from a lineage which is not noble? Is it because I do not have a great fragrance like you have, O Hussein? Allow me to enter the battlefield. Imam responds and says, O John, by Allah, none of these things are the reasons. Go into the battlefield and go and take that, go and fulfill that oath of allegiance that you have presented in front of me. John goes into the battlefield and he too strikes at the enemies like a lion and he too is struck down at this point the narration tells us that when he passes away his is the only body on the tenth of Muharram that is not buried his body is left unburied for three days but despite this the greatest fragrance comes from the body of John and then there is Wahab and then there is Wahab oh brothers and sisters you know the story of Wahab Imagine you now are that newlywed. Go back to that time, that night in which you were newlywed. Imagine what it must have been like to see your partner in that state. Imagine what it must be like for your partner to come to you and say, I am now leaving to enter the battlefield. Wahab's mother says to him, O oh Wahab, I swear by Allah, I will not be pleased with you, nor will you have my intercession on the day of judgment, unless you go and give your life for Hussein ibn Ali. He comes towards his dear wife and says to her, I want to go and engage in the battle. Do you you give me permission his wife is hesitant at this point we have only been married a number of days we have only just been converted towards the religion of Islam how can I let you go my dear husband how can I allow you to enter the battlefield knowing that everyone who has gone has not returned and then she says, please take me towards my master Hussein. Let me stand in front of him to discuss this issue with him. At this point, the wife stands in front of Imam and says, I have been thinking and I allowed my husband Wahab to go into the battlefield on the basis of two things. The first one is that when he dies, I will not have a husband. I want you to take me into the family as if I was one of your own. Look Look after me as if I was one of your own. And the second thing is that I have heard that he will be granted Hul al Ain and beautiful women from paradise. I ask you that when he is married, that you guarantee me that he will not forget me and that I will be with my husband on the day of judgment and in heaven. Hussein ibn Ali looks at this great lady and says, I take an oath that both these things will be fulfilled. I will give you my guarantee for these two things. At this point Wahab enters into the battlefield and he too begins to strike them. The hadith tell us that he enters into that battlefield like such a lion that they cannot bear to attack him. They are incapable of attacking him. Eventually they surround him and then they begin to strike him. But before this point he begins to strike them and dispatch many of the enemies towards hell. He stops and he turns round towards his mother and says, Oh mother, are you pleased with your son for having entered into the battlefield? The mother responds and says, Oh Wahab, I will not be pleased until I see that your body is lying there. I will not be pleased until I know that you have given your life. It is not just entering the battlefield. I want to know that you have given your life for Hussein ibn Ali. And he continues to strike. He continues to attack the enemies but at this point one of the most fateful incidents takes place they begin to strike Wahab they strike him down 
but they do not kill Wahab. They take him by the arms and they drag him towards Umar ibn Sa'ad. They drag him towards Umar and Umar says to him, and he begins to curse him and abuse him. He says to him, indeed, you are a great warrior, but now you have been siding with Hussein. Leave Hussein. How can I leave Hussein at this point? If that is the case, we will strike you into pieces. Umar ibn Sa'ad raises that sword and he strikes the head of Wahab off and at that point he takes it and throws that head towards the mother of Wahab Wahab takes Wahab's mother takes that blessed head and puts it into her lap the blood is oozing from the neck of Wahab he begins to wipe the blood away she begins to stroke the blessed face of Wahab but then she stands up and walks towards the enemies of Allah and is throws the head back towards the enemies as if to say what we give in the way of Hussein we do not take back we have given this in the way of Hussein therefore there is no reason for me to take this back and in that point it is said that the wife or the wife of Wahab runs in towards the enemies and she begins to attack them and they too begin to strike at her Hormala the accursed turns to one of the commanders and says strike this woman down at this point one accursed man raises a spear and strikes this into the head of the wife of, of the wife of Wahab it is said that this is the first and the only female martyr of the event of Karbala her body is lying there also upon the floor upon the plains of Karbala ala la'natullahi ala al-qawmi al-dhalameen wa sayya'lamu al-lazina zalamu ayyu min qalbi an qalibun inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un matimu Hussein ya Hussein